Hi everyone, welcome back to a new episode of Ask an Adventurer. First question today, I've just read it, it's not actually a question, <laughs> but it's interesting, so I'm just going to read it, because it's really interesting. Alistair, um, I'm in tune with the article on our website, The Dilemma of Flying an Adventure. I'm a career pilot having flown in the RAF for 20 plus years before moving to airlines for a short while. Uh, during my final year in the RAF, I discovered paragliding, which since taken over my life. Paragliding is when you jump off a hill with a parachute and float around. Uh, very cool. Uh, at the time, he was flying a hunt, or sorry, they, I don't know who this is. At the time, I was flying a 150 ton VC 10 plane. Never heard of it. Uh, which staggeringly burnt 10 tons of fuel in its first hour. Wow. 10,000 kilograms of aviation fuel up in smoke. Wow. My paraglider, by contrast, weighs 15 kilos and burns zero fuel. Wow. I now teach people to paraglide in the foothills of the parent Pyrenees. Gosh. Um, so he is a convert to the idea of staying local and that fun can be had without trampling all over the planet. Does this person put their website so I can give them a plug? No, they don't. But wow, that was an interesting and not a question at all. <laughs> so this is now a new thing called Tell an Adventurer, which I also like. Put in the, um, in the form below anything you want to tell me. <laughs> um, right, here's a question then. Places online to connect with other adventurers. I've had this question before, so I think someone needs to set up a way for adventurers to meet online. Last time I, I listed um, Explorers Connect, um, Adventure Queens, the Yes Tribe, the Royal Geographic Society has a brilliant thing called Explore in November. But yes, someone needs to set up a website for adventure people to meet each other. Right. Traveling and exploring is great. I always follow the concept of leaving nothing but footsteps. But beside bringing away your rubbish, is there other things we can do to improve the environment we enjoy? So leave no trace is a standard principle of being in the outdoors. Of course, leave no trace. The absolute bare minimum. But I've recently moved on towards the idea of leaving a positive trace. And I got this idea from a an organization called Trash Free Trails, which would be a great one for you to get involved with if you're keen in trying to make the landscape a bit better. So, and this is an idea about trying to leave places better than you found it. And I think this is true, not only in terms of just carrying out other people's rubbish as well as your own, but I think it's, importantly, I think we need to start moving it into a conversational sphere as well. So trying to talk to people whose vested interests are perhaps not aligned with those who care about a clean, sustainable environment, having conversations with these and trying to find overlaps in the things that we're interested in to try and make stuff better. Massively wishy-washy answer. Sign up for Trash Free Trails. Um, when you first started producing books, did you send them to newspapers um, and... Um, magazines did you get anything back from that reviews and comments and stuff yeah definitely so with all my books I've tried to send them out to the major sort of people who are likely to review travel things um, I don't actually think it leads much to sales really to be honest but what I find quite helpful is just those endorsements you get from it amazing book the Sunday Times, stuff like that is really helpful. Also, in recent years, I've started trying to apply, my, enter my book for competitions like the Stanford's Travel Book of the Year, which I think offers a great validation to your writing uh, and to your self-esteem as well. Uh, but again, I don't know how much it translates to stay at sales, but I think it starts to just build up a sense of authority you have within your niche if other people are um, saying nice stuff about your work, not just you saying nice stuff about your work. Um, right, I have two boys. We're going to be try to be more adventurous. What are the ingredients for a perfect outdoor adventure for young children? Gosh, well, I, I cannot begin to claim to have expert parenting advice, but I would suspect it's important to remember that kids are probably more curious and enthusiastic and daft 
and adventurous than us boring adults. So challenge them, push them hard. But equally, you don't want to push them so that it's a miserable experience. So a tiny bit out of your comfort zone, but you don't have to be dragging your kids up a massive mountain in some sort of painful character building thing. Make sure you've got plenty of warm clothes. Make sure you've got plenty of snacks and... Uh, Things like geocaching is great. The geocaching app is a really good way for getting young kids out and exploring and you can trick them that they're doing screen time but actually they're out wandering through the woods looking for treasure. Um, besides adventuring and related activities, what else exists in your future career plans or professional development? Oh gosh, I spend a lot of time thinking how am I going to evolve my life from being adventure guy as I get older and greyer and less adventurous? And you know what? I keep failing on this. I really keep struggling on it. Sometimes I think I'd quite like to go into coaching. Sometimes I just think, though, that's massively narcissistic. And what I actually need is my own coach. Um, I would really like to start to have more of an impact in terms of fixing our broken environment and our broken relationship with our environment and this is perhaps going to be my pivot towards who knows activism politics nature writing so i'm mulling over these sort of things but i don't really have a plan part of the problem i have really is that i earn a nice living having a brilliant time pressing around having fun and it's quite hard for me to pivot away from that yeah. Um, what's the difference between a sponsored expedition and adventures that are done just because with no sponsors? Um, E.g. comparing trips like Colin Fletcher's Grand Canyon Walk with a modern situation where adventurers always thank their sponsors and social media, etc. Well, first of all, it's not a modern thing of people thanking their sponsors in social media. There's brilliant photos on the internet you can find of uh, Scott and Shackleton sitting on boxes of Heinz baked beans and, to, um, and then also going further back of all these explorers naming mountains after people who've uh, paid for their expedition. And so saying thank you on Instagram is definitely not just a thing of people today. And also it's no bad thing. People... Throughout history, there's been three groups of people who've gone on adventures. There have been rich people, there have been poor people who are just entirely happy to go and do something vagabondish. Think, for example, John Clare walking home from his lunatic asylum and sleeping in barns. And then there have been people in the middle who somehow cobbled together some cash to go have an adventure. And the difference really is that once you try and get sponsors, you're then you then have some obligations to tell your story perhaps more than you would like to. You have to perhaps stick to a script more than perhaps you would like to. If, if your adventure totally changes or your emotional attachment to that journey changes, you're kind of contractually obliged a bit to do stuff that the sponsors are going to like. Um, and so I think in a dream world, everybody would rather go do adventures without sponsors. But the second dream world option is to find a sponsor who will help you go have adventures. How much has each of your books made? You know what? I would love the answer to this. And if I had the answer, I would tell you. So I'm not hiding it. But I find uh, I'm just so I find it so hard to pay attention to accounting. <laughs> and to keep tabs on things and generally as long as I've got my bank account is black not red then I'm fine so I literally have no idea how much money my books make which is stupid <laughs> um how would you advise someone going from a well-paid job um a, into what financial management looks like in the adventure world and how to transition to it well my first thing is, do you want to transition away from your well-paid job? Why not keep your well-paid job and just have fantastic adventures at the weekend? If you're really well-paid, why not go down to four days a week and have one day of adventuring? Or try and negotiate that you have one month sabbatical a year to go adventuring, or two months sabbatical a year to go adventuring, and then you've got your money and you've got your adventures. So if you want to transition, though, you have to think, 
why are you doing that? I mean, do you want to, are you interested in writing books, um, teaching people, uh, making videos, uh, speaking to YouTube videos? Do you actually want to do that stuff or do you just want to do the adventures? If you just want to do the adventures, I'd keep your well-paid job and just crack on and then just make more time for adventuring. However, if you are, if you are going to do it, it's really important to manage that transition because when you first start adventuring, you're going to have no stories to tell, no audience to tell it to, and no leverage to get any cash. So you need to find a way where your old money can keep you going for a couple of years, really, at least. And then, you know, what? almost certainly, if you're claiming you've got a well-paid job now, almost certainly you're going to take a massive pay cut when you're an adventurer. There are, you think of a few outlying people, let's say, Bear Grylls, for example, who is an adventurer guy and he's rich, but that's the, not the normal. Most people um, would consider that if they can make a living and have adventure, then that is richness enough. But you're not going to you're very unlikely to make much cash from it. So consider whether you should best just stay with what you've got. <sighs> okay, here's a good question for our, our final question for the day. Do you believe in God? So I grew up um, um, having to go to church. Um, well, we had church stuff every day at school. Uh, I used to go to Sunday school as a kid. Then when I was at university, I was qu quite interested in Christianity. And I was pushing towards being a Christian. I was certainly interested in lots of aspects of it. And then I went off cycling around the world and I met lots of nice Christians then I got to the Middle East and I met loads of nice Muslims and they, what they believe is not what these other people believe and one's right or the other's right, they can't both be right and I spent a long, long, long time, my own 40 days and nights in the wilderness, um, often just sort of pondering life, the universe and everything and I never saw any sign of God in anything that I did on my travels. I saw a lot of goodness but not a lot of God. And so these days I am a full-fledged atheist, but with a small little asterisk that I'm an agnostic atheist because it's a in this enormous, beautiful universe that was once the size of an apple and five quadrillion degrees hot and is now boom this and it's goldfinches and autumn leaves and, and uh, winter frost and spring meadows. That's all pretty miraculous, isn't it? So it's a brave person to claim full on atheism. Uh, so I'm say I'm an atheist filled with awe, wonder, curiosity and hope. And on that note, thank you for all your questions. If you've got any more, please ask them and I will be very, very happy to answer them. Bye.